This week, we welcome Barb Shearer to the Marketing Chief Podcast. Barb has a stellar reputation in the advertising industry, having spent decades on the agency side of the business. Now, she's leading the charge for one of the largest home furniture retailers in the country. Stay tuned for this week's edition of the Marketing Chief Podcast. Welcome to the Marketing Chief Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Collins. If you'd like to watch this podcast and not just listen to it, head over to our website at marketingchiefpodcast.com and click on the Episodes tab or search for Marketing Chief Podcast on YouTube. If you had asked me when I was in high school, if I'd still be friends with someone this far down in my life, I'd be surprised. In fact, today's guest I've known for 75% of my lifetime. Not only did we go to high school together, we went to college together. We studied the same thing, communications, advertising, PR. I was a big brother in her sorority. We have tons of mutual friends. And we both pursued long careers in marketing. I went down the client side of the marketing business, and Barb went down the agency side, headed for the bright lights in the big city of New York City. Today, she is the Vice President of Marketing at Badcock Home Furniture and Barb. I'm pleased to welcome my friend and colleague, Barb Shearer, to the Marketing Chief Podcast. Welcome, Barb. Hi. Happy so, to be here. Thanks for having me. Good, good to have you here. Um, gosh, there's so many things we could tell over <clears throat> number of years that we've known each other. Um, <laughs> when you said you've known me for 75, yeah. and I was like, don't say years. <laughs> no, no, no. 75% of your life is okay. Yeah, 75%, and we're going to leave that undefined at this moment. <laughs> Right. Um, but you've had, gosh, what a great career. It's, it's been fun following you over the years. You know, you've been uh, largely agency side now and, and some client. I've been mostly almost all client. And we've shared stories and war stories throughout the years. Uh, so let's start with where you are now, what you're doing, and, and just talk to me a little bit about Badcock. Sure. As you mentioned, I'm currently the vice president of marketing for Badcock Home Furniture and More, which is actually WS Badcock Corporation, which is the, the corporation that's headquartered in Mulberry, which is south of Lakeland, Florida. A lot of people don't know where Mulberry is, but um, south of the town where we went to college at Florida Southern College. And uh, who knew that I would go full circle and actually end up working right back where I started, um, where our college is based. But I'm head of marketing, so um, I oversee all facets of marketing from, um, you know, strategy, branding, advertising, all the digital and social media, um, as well as the e-commerce team reports to me. Okay. Um, so anything related to uh, e-commerce uh, uh, transactions, shopping, purchasing, and, uh, and marketing of our website, that also falls under me. And so Badcock is is a regional player or, or yes. larger? It's, it's a... It's one of the largest um, home furnishing retailers in the country, but we're a regional player in the sense that we're in the eight southeastern states of the United States, and we have 382 stores now, though, in eight wow. states. Yeah, wow. so in marketing speak terms, we're in 38 DMAs. Yes, that's a lot. And are, <laughs> are they corporate or franchised or, or a mixture? It's, it's a mixture. So... Um, about three quarters of our stores are um, dealer owned. We're a dealer owned network. Um, so a little different than being a franchise, but um, so the dealer network structured a little bit different than franchises. And then the rest are corporate owned stores. How, how does that work with a dealer network? What's what's the difference than a, than a franchise? Um, you know, with franchises, you have a little bit more structure um, as well as, you know, more rules and regulations related to follow by. Um, with a dealer-owned network, there's a little bit more, um, I guess you could say, freedom in terms of how we interact, not as much structure, um, not the same kind of um, fee or compensation structure between the corporation and, and the dealer stores and how they're, they're compensated. Um, we're a little bit different, too, in that we own all the inventory in the stores, um, so it's considered a consignment model. Okay. Uh, because the dealer owners have to own all the inventory that sits in their stores. And the company's been around for a really long time. Yes. We, in late July, early August, are going to be celebrating our 117th anniversary. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Around since 1904. We've got some dealers that, um, you know, they've been around a long time. I won't say how many years, but they now have their sons and daughters working in their stores um, or they're building up to owning multiple stores where they may have, you know, their son or their daughter running some of the other stores for them. 
And then now they're bringing in some of their grandkids even into the business. So it's on both sides of the business, the corporation as well as with our dealers. That's really cool. So you have the benefit of really kind of a homegrown or locally owned business with a much larger brand. I imagine that's a point of difference for you where people are feeling that connection. Absolutely. That's one of the things we did a lot of brand work over the past year, including research. And um, one of the things that we found out that still it's not only in our core values, but it really is part of our brand essence is that, you know, we're multi-generational, we're family owned. We've been in our communities for so many years, in some cases over 100 years, um, particularly inside of Florida. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's really just what's core to the heart of, of Badcock and you know, we are a large corporation. Um, we're the umbrella brand, but really, when you drill down to it, our our dealers and, and those families have been in their communities for years and years, and the people in the community know them, know that their families, they've grown up together. Um, we also talk about our consumers, our customers, are multi generational too. So you have the hmm. corporation, you have the dealers, and then you have our own customers. Where we have customers that are, um, you know, they've been in their 90s and they've come to oh. you know some of our store events or our grand opening events. And we'll introduce them and, you know, they'll talk about how they bought their first furniture from Badcock, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. And they will bring their children in as they become young adults and get their own places to live, to go to Badcock to get furniture. And so we also have the multi-generational customers to the points where their grandkids are now shopping with us as well. That's amazing. I mean, that kind of loyalty and affinity for the brand is unusual and great. I imagine, I'm guessing, what is it, product and quality and stand behind your product guarantee kind of thing? Is that, Are those the elements yeah. that make it make it right? Yeah, because the, the brand actually started out in Mulberry as almost more of like a general merchandise store. Mm -hmm. And so it, it grew from there when they started to open more stores where, um, you know, our name is now Badcock Home Furniture and more. There's a yeah. reason. We didn't always only carry furniture. We've also carried other lines of um, goods, including, you know, household goods. And back in the day, maybe even, you know, horse carriages. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as we refined what our product lines were going to be, we focused on furniture. But the and more piece of it is that we also offer, um, you know, mattresses. We offer appliances. We offer electronics. And um, there's some outdoor products that we also sell. And a lot of them are essential items, uh, which actually helped us during the pandemic as well to keep some of our stores open because we sell, you know, some necessities that people have out in the community. So, you know, they, they would come to Badcock for, yeah, maybe furniture. But um, one of the things that really linked us to them was that they say that we were always there for them. Um, because we had a lot of the essential products that they needed. And because we serve a lot, uh, or primarily suburban and rural towns, mm -hmm. um, you know, back in the day, there weren't a lot of big box stores in close driving distance for them. So Badcock not only served to provide furniture, but like I said, a little more of an extension towards a general store, towards other items that they might need um, besides furniture. So we, we grew with the families. We grew the business um, with the families in those communities. And we were always there for them. And one of the other beauties of our company is that we also are our own finance company. Um, okay. So we do our own lending. Um, obviously, we have partner banks that support us in that. But we lend um, credit to our customers. Way back when, early in the day, you know, before it was you know formalized loans and things like that, um, our Badcock stores used to lend customers uh, money in order to be able to buy their furniture and furnish their homes. And so we've continued with that history and that legacy of helping people get what they wanted in their homes, fulfill their homes, you know, to be the home of their dreams mm -hmm. by having the furniture that they want and fulfilling their needs in their homes. So they've stayed with us. A lot of them, that's why we're multi-generational because we gave them that opportunity and we lent them credit to provide them the ability to have the house that they would like to have, mm -hmm. you know, furnished the way that they'd like to have it. Um, and obviously with fair payment terms, along the way and we've continued to grow that side of our business so we have recurring customers and loyal customers because of the fact that we lend them credit as well you've gone through so many great brand nuggets of the company things that make you different you recently went through a big brand rehaul overhaul redo whatever you want to call it yep. what was the brand known for and then how did it evolve with the new effort what we found was as we 
talked to our customers as well as non-customers, we kind of kept going back to what was really even the original value in line that people knew Badcock for. And even we have an old, old picture of our first store and there's a big sign outside of it besides Badcock. It says Badcock will treat you right. Hmm. And that's what a lot of people would you know, reiterate and talk about how Badcock was there for them over the years and over generations and how we would treat them right throughout the process. And so we talked a lot about, okay, in this day and age, you know, you've got the ability to shop online. There's the digital age. You've got all kinds of competitors out there. You've got the big box stores. You know, why do you all, why do consumers and customers keep coming back to us? And besides the fact that they said we would treat them right, when they looked at and evaluated their shopping options, um, one of the things they said was, yeah, we'd go check out some other stores. We would try this one. We would try another one. We'd look for the right price. We'd re- look for the right selection. Um, but really when it came down to it, we kept coming back to bad pocket cause they were just right for us. So what ended up happening was we established the, the, it's kind of a brand refresh because we didn't really overhaul the brand. We just decided to go back to some of the, the basics of the brand treating people right. And now people were saying, that we were just right for them. So our brand positioning became just right. Well, that actually ended up being becoming our tagline and it's now the campaign. It's the just right campaign. And what makes it just right for them? We've always been known, you know, pretty much as a value brand. Our prices are very fair. Um, And then we've got, you know, product to serve those that are kind of in entry level and may not have the highest income as well. And, you know, and that goes along the lines too with credit where We've been able to cover people at whatever level of credit need that they have, even downscale. If they have had trouble qualifying for credit elsewhere, they may have been able to qualify for credit with Badcock. So in a lot of cases, we've become, you know, not only there for them when they needed a certain product, but there for them when they needed financing. And so we would find and structure financing for them that was just right for them as well. So a lot of, in a lot of cases, they said, well, I shopped elsewhere, but I could find comparable product and value with you, but you would be able to also support me in whatever financing um, scenario I needed in order to secure my, my um, products or furniture. And additionally, because we do serve more of the suburban and rural areas, there's fewer options and fewer of the larger competitors in those markets. So again, they'd say, well, we'd go and we'd travel sometimes even drive to some of these bigger box stores, or we, if we stayed in the more rural areas or small towns, some of those competitors were almost too small for us, didn't have enough selection, Mm -hmm. didn't have the right quality, and they couldn't offer us the financing options that we needed. So we are somewhere in the middle and we call it the Goldilocks effect, where we're we're just right for them because we're somewhere in between. So knowing you, you did a ton of market research, a ton of customer intercepts, focus groups. What came out of that that surprised you? That you were like, man, I, I didn't realize that they thought this about us or that this was an opportunity. Um, I think the misperception by non-customers about Badcock um, and who we are and what we sell and you know where we're located, um, there, there are negative perceptions out there and some of that is what we're gonna have to overcome where once we actually showed some of the people in the focus groups or took you know, some of the shop along um, consumers that we went with in the stores mm-hmm. and they actually looked at what we offered and spent time looking at our product or going into the store and seeing what we we're offering, they were like, oh my gosh, this is Badcock. And so that made us realize, okay, it's, it's, you know, it's a hurdle to overcome, but once people actually take the time to get to know Badcock and come in and see our stores and visit our people and see our furniture and our pricing and what our offerings are, that they go, oh my gosh, wow, this is not what I expected. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a lot better than what I expected actually. So, you know, I would shop at Badcock now. So we have a job to do with those that don't know us because we have so much loyalty on the customer side. Those people that already know us, understand that about us. Those that don't, we have to try to reintroduce Badcock to people that don't know us and get them to take that first step and get them to set foot in our stores. I think once people start to explore us and be open-minded and willing to check out Badcock, that they're going to be, you know, pleasantly surprised and delighted by what we have and what our stores look like. And who is your target? And how do you, 
how do you how do you tell them that message? How do you get that message to them? So it's really that we're trying to meet consumers at the point of their need where mm -hmm. they have decided that they need to update something, they need to replace something, or they need to redecorate. And as they start to go into that buying cycle and that shopping mode, that's where we want to meet them. Where we may have been doing a lot of traditional media advertising before, that really was serving our core customers who, you know, we're not going to abandon. We're going to continue to do what we need to do to take care of our customers. But we also need to introduce that next generation into Badcock. So since I've gotten there, we've really, really ramped up a lot of the, um, you know, the online marketing, the digital marketing, um, and trying to meet consumers where they are when they mm -hmm. start to indicate that they are in a shopping mode, which with digital, you can do that. You know, mm -hmm. as soon as you start to see online behavior where people are looking to shop for furniture or redesign or just checking out decor ideas, that's where we're going to meet them. That's where they're going to see our ads. Do you find that there are certain digital channels that are working better for you than others without revealing any corporate secrets? You know, honestly, we are tracking above industry benchmarks on every area that we are oh, great. investing in. So um, I think what we've done is a, a great multi-channel approach where we have not tried to depend on one you know, silver bullet. Um, we've maintained what we're doing in the realm of broadcast TV and the cable. We've made adjustments you know, to make sure that all of that the spend is appropriate and effective in the DMAs that we're in. Uh, we're also still doing some print, you know, that those flyers or inserts that go into mailboxes, you know, we've adjusted, you know, the frequency and what they look like and what they feel like, um, and, you know, adjusted, you know, some of the targeting and the distribution on those, but we haven't abandoned those as well mm -hmm. because we really wanted to broaden our media mix versus just trying to limit it to where it was, was which was just a few things. Um, so we're we're really happy with what we're seeing with our digital results. I mean, it's just amazing. I, I can't even pick just one that's like blowing it away over the others it's because they're all really working well for us right now. Yeah, and a multi-pronged approach is great, you know, especially if you hadn't been doing anything before. How much of your business is e-commerce? Well, we only actually launched e-commerce two years ago. Okay. So it's still a new business for At us. At least you got it in before the pandemic. So that might maybe Thank help. God. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> we are so thankful that we had e-commerce uh -huh. up and running and we had uh -huh. a, a good probably almost eight months of it being up and running before the pandemic hit. Uh -huh. um, so we were able to you know, tweak some things and make some improvements to the transaction uh, process before that all actually hit us. And good. You know, looking back, we were like, thank God we had e-commerce up and running by then. Yeah. It's, um, you know, we just passed our two-year anniversary with e-commerce, so I'm not going to give you exact numbers or figures, yeah, no. but we have more than doubled our business each of the two years. So from nothing to something to more than double. To, to something, twice something. Yeah, that's great. We're looking at probably quadrupling that this year. So it's, Congratulations. it's an awesome investment. Yeah. yeah. Let's go back a little bit. I remember we both graduated college, you know, big stars in our eyes. We were entering the big communications advertising world. I took the safe route, went home. You took the challenging route and went to the big city of New York City, worked at a major ad agency. If my memory's right, Diet Coke was one of your clients. So t talk to us about that decision and that experience. I don't want to say it was Mad Men days because it was way past Mad Men days, but it was very different world than it is today. So tell me tell me about New York City back in the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was kind of crazy where I decided <laughs> I didn't want to start small. I wanted to go big. So you went, you went big and, and what a what a great leap into the career. I think it was yeah. a great decision. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sorry that I ever did it there. You know, I hate to say you have regrets. Sometimes there are other career decisions that sometimes I wish I would have made or not made. That, that's um, a, that's the subject for a whole other podcast, and I have plenty to yeah, add to that one. Call me because I can fill up a whole hour. <laughs> with that. Um, but yeah, so I decided to take off to the big city. You know, fortunately, I had a few friends from college that were also going to be doing the same thing. So I had you know roommates once I got up there and we got an apartment. But I just decided to you know pack up and go to New York City and see what I could do there. And with a thousand dollars in my pocket and two friends to room with, that's what I did. And um, so th speaking of Mad Men days, it's funny that you mentioned that because I do tell the story that I came in at the end of the Mad Men era to New York where there was still a lot of stereotyping mm -hmm. 
And in order for me to get the first job at the ad agency that I did join, um, I had to basically take a typing test and be able to type at least 75 words per minute. <laughs> but all that to say, I did join the Diet Coke account, which was you know one of the best decisions I did make. But I did look around and go, okay, I really wish I could have gotten into like a management training program, which was mm -hmm. really the best way for people to get into New York and start and start to move up. You got trained on everything about the accounts. What I noticed is most of the people that were in those entry level management training programs um, was that they were somehow tied by family to somebody that was likely a client of the agency mm -hmm. or some senior executive of the the company and the agency, um, you know, so I understood and learned quickly that, you know, nepotism, you know, was going to be rampant in New York city. So my path then was be able to be able to type 75 words per minute and be willing to start you know, <laughs> with the title of basically administrative assistant, even though, you know, in the current day and age, you know, that would be the same thing as being a marketing coordinator now. Right. So, yeah. But did, I did, did join, I joined the diet Coke account, which was just an awesome experience. That had to be, I mean, back back in those times, especially, uh, it had to be your great training ground, learning ground, even if some of the opportunities weren't there. Yeah, the agency, I, you know, I was glad I went to that agency too, because they primarily handled like just consumer goods, consumer packaged goods, consumer products and beverages. Um, so we had a lot of great consumer brands at the agency and Diet Coke was only, it was a fledgling brand. It was probably only about two years old when I got there. Um, so Coca-Cola had just launched it a few years prior. And um, it was an exciting time. And one of the ways that they built the brand was on, you know, basically a celebrity based platform mm -hmm. or conceptual direction for um, TV ads. So we had celebrities in our ads. Sometimes we'd have them waltzing them into the office and, you know, I'd get to meet some of them sometimes when they were coming in. Um, the account supervisor that I supported and reported to, he was responsible for basically all of the talent um, acquisition and talent negotiations, work with our attorney at the agency um, to work with the celebrities and write the contracts and everything. So it was kind of fun. I got to meet like, you know, Vanna White and some WWF wrestlers came through. These are during the time too when um, actually we hired um, this young, new, up and rising singer and star called Whitney Houston to do one of our commercials. <laughs> and he was in our commercial and literally within months later was when she hit like all those number one songs, number one album. I mean, and she just, she just flew up into the rankings. And so we just had really good timing in terms of having her in a Diet Coke spot. So you moved from New York and obviously you trailblazed and were very successful in the advertising community because you then were leading some regional agencies in Orlando um, throughout your career. Did you have to create those opportunities yourself? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, we talked about challenges earlier and that we mm -hmm. could do a whole other <laughs> podcast about that. But as you know, in our industry, um, it, it's not always the most stable industries. So mm -hmm. in some cases, you're forced to make changes or changes are forced upon you. Um, I feel like I've always had the good fortune of whenever one door closed, another one opened for me. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, I could say I created it. And in a lot of cases, I would say probably one of the best things that I did was, um, and I did not necessarily do this intentionally, um, but you know, you talk a lot about having to build your own brand and reputation. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow along the way, I did that. I started to build my own brand and my own reputation within the industry. Um, after I left New York City, I went and worked in Tampa Bay for about seven years at agencies there, uh, moved up to running the whole Florida lottery account, um, which at the time was the largest advertising account in the state of Florida as far as government contracting. What, what agency was that? Um, it was Earl Palmer Brown. Okay. And yeah, while I was there, we um, we were merged with Yes Witch Pepperdine Brown. So right, right, right. TV during that last year there. And, um, but that was such a huge account. It was very high profile, yeah. but um, one of the things that happens with that in government contracts is that they go up for review. So mm -hmm. the account went up for review. 
we pitched it. Unfortunately, we didn't end up keeping the account. And as a result, you know, I had to, you know, tell my team over in the St. Pete office, well, you know, 23 of you are getting basically your pink slips today uh, that we have a week or a month until we transition the account to the next agency. So, you know, we're going to give you the, the time that you need if you want to go out and interview, look for jobs. But in the meantime, we still need to transition the account to the next agency. And what ended up happening for me was before that month was over, I actually got a call from a uh, general manager of an ad agency in Orlando um, at the time, and it was called Greenstone Roberts. And mm -hmm. this day, that person is one of my very close friends, Kathy Ryan. Um, and she was following what was going on with the pitch for the Florida lottery. And she was like, you know, if that agency doesn't keep that account, and that's a really good account for someone to get great experience on, you know, those people may be out of jobs and I'm looking to hire some great people. Mm -hmm. So she contacted, when she found out that we did not keep the account, she contacted the agency and said, Hey, I know you're going to have to let go of some really good people. Can you recommend to me, you know, one of your senior account people, uh, because I'd like to hire somebody over here at the agency. So, um, the person that I reported up to, um, the general manager over our Florida lottery account for Florida, um, he recommended me, so I got contacted. Um, I hadn't even really started putting myself out there for interviews or job search or anything yet. And um, I came over and I interviewed and I ended up getting a job offer. So I actually had my next job before I finished my stint on that account and did the transition. So um, all that to say that that sort of happened to me multiple times, either, you know, if I've chosen to leave, um, or if it's been a change that's forced upon me, mm -hmm. there has often been a door that's already opening for me on the other side. And so I've been very fortunate. And, you know, a lot of it was just, you know, you know do great work, <laughs> be, be a great asset to, to a company and do great work. And also I got involved in the industry. So I was very involved in the advertising industry once I got to Orlando and work my way up through the Advertising Federation here with the Orlando chapter, and then all the way up through um, the district organization to be the governor over all of Florida and the Caribbean. And so again, I've continued to build my brand. So that just always opened up the next door for me. Where you start getting a great brand is doing great work for great clients. Talk a little bit about what you just hit on, which Ad Club and Ad Federation, especially for those coming up through marketing, why that was so critical and so important for your personal brand, for career opportunities, but also just for your personal enrichment and w what you got out of that. Yeah, that was um, that was my extracurricular activities, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I refer to them. Um, you know, what it did was it, it actually helped me with my transition to Orlando because um, I was going through a divorce when I lost that Florida lottery job. And, you know, here I was moving to a, a new city, um, going back to being single, uh, establishing myself in a new market. And I thought, well, you know, what's a great way for me to at least start to meet new people and establish myself? Well, AdFed, because I had some experience with it in Tampa. I was not nearly as involved as once I got to Orlando, but um, I chose that because, you know, I was so passionate about the industry and uh, I loved, you know, the creativity of it and I loved being involved uh, with the awards side of it. So I immediately got involved with the Addy Awards. And, um, you know, I'd had the experience of working at some great agencies in Tampa. And then subsequently, I, you know, during my years in Orlando at ad agencies, I worked with some of the best creatives that I've ever worked with in my entire career. And so I thought that was an opportunity too for me, not just within my own job and company to build leadership school skills and management communication skills, but also to do that outside of the company mm -hmm. and to interact with other people that, you know, I may not necessarily have to interact with, you know, as part of my team or they were not necessarily my bosses. I had to learn how to collaborate with different people and different, you know, communication styles and different personalities, as well as take on projects. And, um, you know, when your reputation's on the line, you really want to make sure that you deliver. So I put a lot of that own pressure on myself to perform not only within my company, but also, you know, within the ad, ad federation. Mm -hmm. um, so that just, you know, continued to build my, my skills and my network of, friends and people that eventually, you know, I refer to almost like my second family um, in that organization, just because we had 
such great time. There's so much trust. There's so much collaboration. Uh, we did so much good for the ad industry during those years that I was heavily involved. Uh, and I really enjoyed being connected to a national organization. So, you know, I'd made the choice after a few years in New York City to leave. Um, and once you come back to Florida, you're not necessarily working on quite as big of a scale or scope of companies and clients as you are when you're in New York City. So by becoming part of a national organization, that also allowed me to reconnect back with things that were bigger than me. And mm -hmm. that's what I wanted was some some connection to make sure that I was kind of always staying in sync with, you know, maybe we're doing some things at the local regional level, but what's going on at the national level that we can learn from and maybe incorporate into what we're doing here in Florida. Those types of organizations are really energizing because you're with people in your same role at different companies and they're really not your competitors, right? I mean, you go after the same accounts, but you're not really competitors. And you realize that everyone you meet, you can add value to, you can get a new perspective from. And by the way, one day they may be your employee or employer, right? Because right. It, is a small, it is a small world after all. <laughs> We're kind of coming up on our time and I'd be cognizant of that. Anything that you would give for inspiration to those coming up in their career, whether it's books or people you listen to or anything that kind of inspires you? Gosh, I think it's just always the people for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just just remember, you know, a lot of people get in and um, they're just worried about themselves and their own ambition and don't, you know, don't burn bridges. Don't tread on people along the way because um, I used to have some of that in me when I was so ambitious when I was younger. And I really, at an early age, started to realize like you need the people next to you, under you, above you just as much and more maybe than they need you. Um, you know, so just make the most of all the relationships that you come across along the way because, you know, like you said, it's a small world. Mm -hmm. So those people can come back around to really be there for you when you need them. Um, and to help you with your career. Plus, um, I never really, a lot of people talk about getting like a mentor, a single person that they can kind of point out and lay a finger on um, as being able to help them with their career. But I, I kind of look at it as, I think a lot of people enrich, enrich me along the way. It wasn't just one person. I tried to learn from everybody um, as I went along, the good and the bad and the ugly, mm -hmm. um, because I did, you know, I did have some really bad managers along the way. And I think I learned probably a lot more about what not to do um, sometimes than what to do when, especially when you're moving up and you're managing people. So just really think about the people aspect of your job and who you're interacting with. Um, you know, how do you want to be treated? And you know, that's how you should treat other people because that goes a long way. And I know that's not really specific to advertising, but I think that's probably what counts most. And ultimately, um, in the end, that's who you're going to remember. What you're going to remember is the people. It really is, Barb. I think that's a great way to end because you can be true to yourself. You can be aggressive. You can have big, strong goals, but you can also treat people nicely as you're doing it, as you're going up the ladder and as you're coming down the ladder, right? That's people right. are people are all, all, all at different places. Um, I've always tried to surround myself with I'm, people smarter than me because I'm going to learn from them. And you know what? If they If they leapfrog me, so be it. Maybe it was meant to be, but I'm going right. to learn something from them at that time. Um, great way to end. Anything else you want our listeners to know about Backpack Home Furniture? More? Um, you have to see us to believe us. So come to our stores because you won't believe how great we are until you get there. And if you have never shopped with us, um, you'll understand what a great brand it is, what, what a wonderful heritage um, we have You know, within the family that owns the company as well as the stores and the operators themselves. Um, you know, we're, we're authentic and we're true. You talk about being true to yourself. I think Bag Talk is true to, to ourselves um, and to the brand across the board. And um, we make people a part of our family. It really is a, a family oriented corporation. And um, we consider our customers to be our family and our guests, not just our customers. Perfect. And if they want to shop on an e commerce level, they go to www.badcock.com. Okay, simple, badcock.com. Thank you. Barb, yeah. thank you. It's been <laughs> great catching up. Love seeing you, love catching up, and I really appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's been fun catching up with you too. If you like what you hear on the Marketing Chief Podcast, 
Be sure to subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast app or YouTube and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts. We'll see you next time on the Marketing Chief Podcast.